For part three of our How to Open a Record Store series, we are going to discuss probably the funnest part of the job, and that is inventory, most specifically pre-owned or vintage records. Where do you find them? How do you grade them? How do you learn how to price them? Where should you sell them? I'm gonna unpack it all on this episode, talking about records. My name is G.I. Sanders from NTX Final, a small chain of independent record shops in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If you aren't local but you're in the U.S., you can shop online at ntxvinyl.com and would love it if you'd subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and follow us across social media on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. All right, we are on part three of our How to Open a Record Store series. Uh, like I mentioned at the top, uh, inventory. This is probably the most interesting because this is where you actually get to deal with records, right? The most exciting part of uh, owning a record store in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we are going to drill in specifically to pre-owned or used or vintage records on this episode. In a future episode coming up after this, we'll talk about new records, which is a completely different animal in a lot of ways. But Pre-owned records, used records, vintage records, these are the lifeline of a record store or for most record stores, I will say. And that's primarily because if executed properly, you can make more money on a used record versus a new record. Not always, but there are typically better margins if you know how to buy. So we're going to talk about where to source pre-owned, used, vintage records. We're going to talk about actually purchasing them. We're going to talk about a little bit about grading and pricing as well as selling pre-owned records. So first and foremost, the biggest question is where do you get them, right? Where do you source pre-owned used vintage records? Well, uh, I've done other videos on how uh, record stores acquire large collections and right. But the reality is when you're first starting out, you don't have a lot of advantages. You don't have a customer base of record collectors who may want to sell at some point. You don't have uh, branding and exposure for your store out there that people may find you because if you're just starting out, again, it's a blank slate. So you've got to put a few things in place um, so that you can get discovered because the best way to acquire pre-owned records is to sit back and wait for them to come to you. Now, that takes time. That's not gonna happen right off the bat. Um, that'll come later, again, once you're an established business, once you have an established customer base, once people can go to Google and search for a record store because they're looking to sell records and they may find you. So those are all those are all things that'll come kind of later as we're talking about this. But from a sourcing perspective, where do you find them? Well, it's gonna come down to a couple things. It's gonna come down to First and foremost, hustle. There's no way you're going to land a big collection or land a bunch of rare records, talking pre-owned stuff, unless you're willing to put in the legwork. That means you've got to, um, you've got to get out there and talk to people, whether that's online, whether that's in the real world. You've got to let people know that you're looking for records. Um, you've got to be on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and at estate sales and at garage sales. Uh, uh, flea markets and antique malls and uh, swap meets and record shows, all of these places, you've got to get out there and network and do everything you can to put yourself in, in a position to land some decent used records. Because out of every opportunity that presents itself, let's say there's, you know, 10 opportunities, you know, probably only one of those is going to be really good. Like, out of all the record digs I go on on a weekly, monthly basis, like, you know, it's, it's yeah, maybe one out of 10 or one out of five, if I'm lucky, do I come away with something really great, right? And so it's about um, repetition. It's about going out there and taking some chances. Sometimes you're going to drive all the way across town. You're going to drive a couple hours and end up with just a few records or end up with no records at all. Or in, because the person just wanted too much money for them or the condition was really bad. And so those are all things to be 
just expect those pitfalls. There's no way around them. But in reality, you got to get through that phase. You've got to push through that because all of those scenarios. So even though you may go out and, and you know, dig for records 10 different times, 10 different places, maybe only purchase one of those lots or collections, you're going to learn something on those other nine about how to negotiate better, about how to communicate better up front so you don't waste your time. Um, you know, those are all of the things that you're going to uh, uh, absorb from a knowledge perspective along the way. So they're not wasted. Even though you may not come away with uh, a bunch of great records to sell, you're still learning and you're still learning how to communicate people, how to, how to uh, you know, what your sales pitch is, what your, your spiel is when you talk with people. There's definitely a methodology to what you want to do. Um, and you got to get comfortable with that. Like there's a lot of people I know who just, uh, you know, who aren't really good at negotiating. So that's when we get into kind of buying, right? So let's say, um, let's say you've done a good job of putting yourself out there. Um, as far as advertising, um, you've gone on social media, you've networked, like I mentioned about all those different places. And so maybe you've gotten into a position where a few people have said, Hey, I do have some records. Do you want to come over and look at them? You know, what does that look like? And how do you get to a point where you actually want to buy those? Right? So, First and foremost, just to recap, from a sourcing perspective, it's all about hustle. You've got to be first. You've got to want it more. You've got to take some chances. So if you're not willing to do that, then you're probably going down the wrong path, right? Um, and you've got to be you've got to be really comfortable talking with people. Like I, I can't preface that enough. Communication is probably the single most important part when you're trying to source pre-owned used records or collectibles of any kind, right? Because you've got to be, uh, you got to be personable. You've got to really want to talk to people. Um, I'm not always that way. Sometimes my phone rings and I'm just like, I don't even want to answer it. And there could be a great collection on the other line, but I'm in the middle of something else. And I don't want to stop what I'm doing to have a discussion with someone. Cause I know there's, it's, it's a chance, you know, um, by and large, the, the, the vast majority of people who contact you have a bunch of garbage that you're not going to want, but you got to, you got to work through those. You got to talk to everyone. You got to take, like I said, take some chances. Um, uh, word of mouth is huge. Networking is huge. So again, put yourself out there, be ready to field a lot of conversations, talk to as many people as you can, collectors, uh, non-collectors about what you do, because the more you can spread the word around that you're looking for records, uh, that's the best chance you've got of someone actually contacting you in addition to going out and hustling at all those different places that I mentioned. So sourcing is hard. Again, look up my other video on how to acquire uh, large collections. Most of the times when you're a record store, they come to you. So when you're just starting out and you don't have that credibility, you don't have that base in place, uh, you're going to have to do everything you can to get your word, uh, to get the word out there, to get your face in front of people and talk to people and uh, hopefully land a couple of opportunities that will become fruitful. Um, so the art of negotiation, this is, this is kind of what I was alluding to in regards to buying. I get asked all the time. So you go into someone's house or you meet up with someone or they come to you, whatever it may be. And they've got, let's say, let's just say 500 records, which is a pretty good size record collection. Like I'd say most of the, most of the collections I buy are two or three boxes, which may be a hundred, 200 records. You know, that's kind of, at least from my perspective, uh, a pretty normal sized collection, anything over a couple hundred, let's say 500 plus, like that's a large collection. Most people didn't collect that many records back in the day, like, cause they take up a lot of space. They're, you know, even, even when they weren't expensive, they were still expensive, you know, based on, uh, you know, time and place. Right. So you, you get this scenario where there's an opportunity with, uh, let's say a 500 piece collection. And the question I get all the time is how do you know what to pay for it? Like how, what do you offer people? Well, the first thing you've got to understand is, you've got to, the most important thing in any retail business is margin, right? And your cost of goods. That is critical here when we're talking about pre-owned records, because if I go and I look at a single record, or if I look at an entire record collection, I'm not just thinking how much can I pay for this in hard, hard money. And then how much can I sell it for? Like, that's a great baseline, but if I'm paying $5 a record and these records, I know 
on average, let's say for $10. One would think, man, that's a great margin. You're making $5 a record, right? Bought it for five, sold it for 10. You've got to take into consideration your costs of labor and storage and supplies and more than anything, the time it takes. So you've already had to communicate with this person back and forth, maybe several times. You have spent your time in most cases driving to them because in most, in most scenarios, people are not going to want to load up their records and drive them to you. You've got to go to them. So you spent your time communicating with them. You spent your gas money. You spent your time actually, um, you know, making the trip wherever it may be. Maybe it's close by, maybe it's not. So you're already invested uh, from a labor perspective and from a time perspective. Then you've got to take into account, all right, well, I've got to load all these records out, drive them back to, you know, your shop or your storage, your house, wherever you're going to manage them. Um, you've got to then inventory all those records. You've, you've at least got to go through them and see what you have. A whole lot of them, you're going to have to research them. That takes a lot of time. You're going to have to clean them. Certainly takes a lot of time. Some collections are super clean. Some are filthy. So there's there's a big variable there that goes into it. Um, and then you got to take into consideration uh, the time it takes after you've kind of cleaned it and then grade it. Then you've got a price in mind. You've also got to sleeve it. You've also got to put a price tag on it. That's a lot of work. So you bought it for five. You're going to sell it for ten. But what are you really making? If you take into consideration all of that time and effort and all of those steps that go in to actually getting that record priced and on the floor of your record store, like you're not making $5. You're lucky if you're making two or three. And that's, that's kind of being nice here, honestly. That's why record stores traditionally pay very, very little for pre-owned records, especially larger collections, because the larger the collection, the more work that's involved. And again, I've done extensive videos on this, on, on how to acquire, how record stores acquire large collections. I'll link to that because it's very informative and goes into more te detail. But that's the biggest thing. That margin is the most important part. So when you're going into that scenario, they've got 500 records. Don't just be thinking, okay, what can I sell those for? Like, first of all, out of all 500, you're not going to have chance. You're not going to have the chance, or in most cases, to go in and look at all 500. That would take and understand what you have there from a con from a pressing standpoint, from a variant standpoint, from a condition standpoint, a cleanliness standpoint. You're going to have to eyeball it. You're going to have to go. Okay, these that I look through look pretty clean, so I'm going to anticipate that the rest of these are in a similar condition from a similar era, similar artist, right? You can flip through them as quickly as you can, but you're going into someone's home in most cases, you know, you got 30 minutes max. Like it's very awkward to go into someone's home and be like, Hey, what are you doing this afternoon? I'm going to come over for a couple hours. You don't even know the person like that never happened to me. In most cases I go in and I tell people again at the beginning when there's communication, I tell them, Hey, I just need 15, 30 minutes, unless it's a collection of thousands, like that's all you should anticipate having. So you've got to be able to go in, eyeball that collection based on genre, era, condition, quality, and come up with an idea of what that's worth. And this is all in your head in real time while you're talking to the people because then you haven't seen it until you walk in. If you're good at communication, maybe you've seen a little bit about it. The first thing I always do when I talk with someone about a collection is first and foremost, where are you located? Because I want to know how far away you are. If they say they're five hours away, that completely changes the reality of the conversation and how interested I am. If they're close by or I'm willing to make the effort, show me some pictures. I need you to show me some proof that it exists. Show me some proof that uh, what types of artists and genres there are and what type of condition it is. Again, I'm looking for anecdotal evidence just to give me confidence to book the appointment, to make the drive, right? I hate going into things blindly. In fact, after a couple of years of this, I almost refuse. The only time I'll go into something blindly is if it's really close. If someone uh, someone hits me with uh, an inquiry and says, I've got records and they're within, let's say 15, 20 minutes. I'll sometimes go blind. Any further than that, you've got to show me some pictures. I got to talk to you on the phone. That's the other thing. Communication wise, when buying, 
do everything you can to talk to someone on the phone. If it's just via email or just via text, like I don't feel as confident with that. So I always try and talk to the people. I tell them my perspective of how I buy and, and those types of things. And I be as upfront as possible, as transparent as possible, because um, again, like you're going into a scenario where you've got to develop some sort of trust with this person. They're going to want to sell you their record collection, which they may be attached to, and it may be completely nostalgic and it could have been owned by their, their parents or something. So they don't want to let go of it. On the flip side, I talk with people all the time who they want nothing to do with these records. They just want them out of the closet. They don't know where they came from. They've been sitting around for years. They haven't literally haven't played them in 30 years. So they don't have any emotional attachment there. So there's lots of different scenarios and that's the type of stuff that you'll learn by talking to them on the phone. And that's going to help you when it comes to making your offer, right? Because if you know, this person is very knowledgeable about what they have, uh, and you, you can tell from talking to them that they're very sentimental about it and they're kind of begrudgingly selling. They don't really want to sell, but they know they need to like, that's going to, that, that has a huge impact on what you should offer versus again, someone who just wants it gone. And they basically call you up and say, Hey, I was going to go to the dumpster and throw all these out. Do you want them instead? Like that's a completely different mindset than going into that dig or going into that opportunity or appointment. Right? So you go in there, you need to be keeping in mind the, 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 the conversations that you've already had leading up to the appointment. Um, hopefully you've already got an idea of at least what era the records come from, maybe what genre. A lot of times people will just say, well, I saw, you know, I saw a, a Bee Gees record and I saw a Johnny Cash and, oh, I saw some Elvis, you know, like that's typically what you hear. And what you're looking for is indicators. You're looking for signs. Like I typically say, hey, anything in there from Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, you know, the Beatles, uh, Fleetwood Mac, Eagles, again, trying to establish, okay, is this like a kind of a standard 60s, 70s, classic rock, popular music collection? Or are they gonna respond and say, oh no, all I see is, uh, you know, Duke Ellington and, uh, you know, Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra. Okay, so I'm dealing with like maybe earlier 50s type big band jazz type stuff. Like, again, that's gonna give me a lot of information. So as I go into this, I've kind of got a, uh, an understanding of what's there. So. Get as much information as you can in advance, commit to the appointment, and then you go in and a lot of it comes down to condition. A lot of it comes down to your ability to uh, look through a collection of records and know what you're dealing with. And again, that only comes with time. The first few collections I bought, I was completely guessing. Like I had no idea. Like I remember the first bigger collection I bought, which was again, maybe a thousand records. So double the 500 that we were using in our example. But if I think back to that, you know, did I overpay for it? Absolutely. I overpaid for it. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just saw a bunch of cool records, a bunch of stuff that I didn't own at the time. And I was excited. So I had, you know, blinders on, uh, in, in many cases, but that's okay because I learned a lot. And now looking back, I know that I overpaid for it. And I know out of that collection, what I probably should have paid for it. It's the other big thing that I tell people all the time is, okay, they've got 500 records. I've looked through them. I've spent my, my 10, 15 minutes. I'm talking with them while I'm, uh, while I'm looking, talking to them about where they came from, talking about, um, you know, um, uh, which of these that they may care about, if any, like just having casual conversation, trying to extract knowledge. I'm looking through them going, okay, either in my mind, I'm sorting them, which is hard or I'm physically sorting them. If they're not in any order, this is key. Sometimes you go into a, um, um, uh, an appointment and they'll all be alphabetized and organized. So you don't wanna go in there and just start pulling them all out because then let's say you don't come to, uh, come to an agreement and you don't purchase them. Well, then that person's left with a, just a, a completely mess of a room and a collection. So you don't wanna do that. That's usually not the case. Normally they're in boxes, you're pulling them out of closets or a storage unit or something, right? So if they're not organized, well, then that gives you the ability to just ask the person, hey, do you mind if I you know, put these into groups? Cause that'll help me get a better understanding. And in most cases they're fine with that. So then as you're going through, you're pulling out all of the 
what I call top tier artists. So you're pulling out the Pink Floyd, the Queen, uh, the Led Zeppelin, and then, you know, all of the more common stuff. You like, you know, Three Dog Night and Doobie Brothers and Dan Fogelberg and, you know, nothing wrong with those. They're just more common artists. They're, they're going to sell for two, three dollars a piece, whereas this other group over here of the more top tiers are going to sell for maybe 10, 15, 20. So separate them out as much as you can. And then what you're left with is, you know, again, you started with 500. Maybe you've picked out, let's say, is a really good collection, and, you, and there's half of them that um, are more of those top tiers, or at least leaning towards that, right? Then you can explain to the person that, hey, I'll pay you X number of dollars for these 250. But these ones over here, I'm going to pay you a lot less because they're less desirable, they're more common. Or maybe you sort them based on condition. You can also do that as well or within, you know. Um, so those are the ways that, again, and this all happens very quickly. But that's where I would say, hey, this, this collection, you know, this portion of the collection over here is 250 records. I'll pay you, let's say, you know, maybe the really clean, high-end stuff. Maybe it'll pay five dollars a piece, right? So you can do the math. Five times two hundred and fifty. Okay, I'm in that. These over here, I can only pay you fifty cents each because I can only sell them for a dollar or two. You know. So again, you're keeping that margin in mind. In most cases, people want you to take them all. Like there are some scenarios where people will be like, "Yeah, just pick out the ones you want." But that's called cherry picking, right? Most people don't want you to cherry pick because again, they're contacting you because they want this closet emptied. They want all of it out of their hair, right? That's the most likely scenario. So putting the albums into groups, into bundles based on uh, tiers of what you think they can sell for is very important. But again, when you get them in those tiers, you still got to be keeping that margin in mind. Because just because you know, oh man, there's a bunch of top tier records from you know Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, and, and again, the, the hot hot artists and hot titles that sell a lot quicker and demand a higher price point, you still got to bring them all home you still got to bring them back to your shop and you got to do all that work. You've got to inventory them and uh, research them and clean them and grade them and price them, all those types of things. So keep that margin in mind. And most importantly, explain that to the person. Like that's the most beneficial thing. It's very logical. Uh, and most people are receptive to that concept. Because when you tell them, they go, oh, yeah, I, I could see that, you know, because they know how much work it is because they just had to pull. They just pulled four or five boxes out and they're already like, I don't want to deal with them anymore. And you're like, hey, I've got to go through these in detail one by one, manage every single one of them in regards to figuring out what it is, what year it came from, what pressing it is. And then I've got to clean it, price it, grade it, sleeve it, all those types of different things. When you tell that to people, they're like, yeah, it sounds like a lot of work. I'm like. Yeah, that's, that's what owning a record store is. It's a lot of work versus they don't own a record store. They just want this gone. So if they're asking retail, they'll be like, oh, well, if you say those sell for 20, then I want 18. I'm like, nice talking with you, sir. Like that, that happens, right? It happens. Been in plenty of scenarios where people go to eBay and they put in, you know, I'm just going to use the most common example, Beatles White Album, Michael Jackson Thriller. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Those, those are some of the most common examples. They put it into eBay and they, well, I put, I looked this up online and I saw them selling for hundreds. Like you hear it all the time and you just explain to people, there are absolutely uh, Beatles albums or Elvis albums or Michael Jackson albums that are worth lots of money, but they are very, very rare amongst millions of common albums by those artists that were the most popular in the world. Secondarily, what you're looking at online in most cases is what people hope to sell an album for. Because most people don't know that when you go to eBay, you have to actually filter it by what has sold. You know, they just go look at buy it now and they see, oh my gosh, all these Beatles albums, they just sort it by the most expensive ones. And then they, they expect that what they have in their collection is exactly aligned. Because to them, a Beatles album is a Beatles album. Like they, they don't know that there's literally 450 plus different pressings of the White Album. Like how would they know that? They, they don't have any idea. They don't understand it all. So you've got to educate a little bit. If you want to get a good deal on a collection, you've got to educate the person you're buying from. That's probably the biggest takeaway here. Be as transparent as possible. Be as educational as possible. Now, when you're just starting out, you haven't done this a lot. Maybe you don't have that much education to uh, to uh, to present to the person, but you got to do your best. And again, 
you're going to learn over time. You're going to get better at this. You're going to get more fluid. I can go into a, uh, uh, an appointment now and look at several thousand records and spend just a few minutes and get a pretty good idea of what I would want to pay, right? Whereas if I reverse time, go back five years when I started this, like I wouldn't have had any idea and I was totally shooting blind, which is exactly, which is exactly what I was doing. So the art of buying, it truly is an art. You'll, uh, the only thing I can tell you is to dive in, um, start taking as many conversations as you can, start talking to people about their collections, um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, take some chances. Like sometimes you're gonna, I've bought collections before, not sight unseen, but very quickly. And in the end, I've regretted it because condition wasn't as good as I thought it was. You know, I look through them, but then by the, you know, when you try and spot check a few records, that's all you can do. You can spot check. If I'm looking at 500 records, I'm spot checking 20, 30, 50 records if I'm lucky. And that's going really quickly too. But, you know, there could be a whole section of those records that the jackets look fine. And then you realize when you get them back and you've already purchased them, that oh man, these are all scratched up. Whoever had that portion of the collection, they did not take care of it. So again, those are, you, you live and learn with all those scenarios, but you won't, uh, you won't learn at all if you don't go out and just do it. There's no handbook. There's no, um, you know, other than something like learning from a video like this of someone who's done it before, other than talking to other people who have done it, there's no way to uh, go out and practice such a thing other than in, in a, a real world scenario, right? So that's, that's what I can recommend the most in regards to buying. After you've bought it, so you've sourced it, you've bought something, grading and pricing. This is huge. And I'm actually going to do another video coming up next. Um, that will be a full demonstration on how I grade and how I price. So I'm looking forward to doing that because I think that'll be really educational. But in short, um, what you need to do is a lot of research because um, similar to, to buying used records, like there's no way to really learn how to do it other than just diving in and doing. But researching up front will help you a lot. Um, you need to research how to grade, first of all, and the gold mine pricing standard is one thing to read up on because you need to know the difference between fair, good, good plus, VG, very good plus, near mint, mint, like those are all the different grades within this standard system, which most people live by, most collectors, most record stores uh, live by some variation of that, right? And, and some, my VG plus, which is sh short for very good plus as a grade, is different from someone else's VG plus. Like that's the hard part about grading. It's very subjective. Some people, you see it all the time, right? You people say, oh, you can't play the cover, right? Some people don't care if the cover's all beat up and water damaged and ripped. If the record is great and it plays, then they'll buy it, right? Other people, they would not stand to have an album in their collection that has a jacket which is completely all torn up. Uh, even if the record is good it's because they want the, the, the whole package, right? So there's a lot of different mindsets and you got to figure out like where you sit in that. Um, so it's very subjective, but you've got to start somewhere. Again, you got to dive in and start establishing how you grade um, as much research as possible, not only online, I, I say research and I think immediately my head goes to like go to Discogs go to, or go to eBay, go to Pop Psych, these different tools you can use to research pressings of what people are selling records for. That's really important. But also research in the real world. You need to be hitting every record show. You need to be hitting every antique mall. You need to be hitting every other record store in town to shop and learn and talk with people but you need to be looking through their pre-owned records and seeing what they're priced at and learning which record stores overprice, which record stores undergrade or overgrade. Like you've got to understand all that stuff. You've got to go in and see albums on a repetitive basis and go, okay, Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA. You know, this record store's got it for $15 and it's not going to say the grade on it. No one, no one puts the grades on the records, but they've got it priced at $15 and you're looking at it and you're going, man, this looks pretty clean. I don't see any scratches at all. The record's really clean. The jacket looks virtually brand new. So this looks like a, let's say in my mind, a, a, a VG plus or a near mint record, right? Probably VG plus if it's pre-owned. Then you might go to another record store and they might have that same copy or at least a similar pre-owned copy of Bruce Spring Springsteen, Born in the USA, and they might have $30 on but this one's got a dinged corner and 
looks a little scuffed up and you're like, man, this, this first record store, it was in better condition at a better price. And this record store over here, you know, it's a little beat up and they've got it for double the price. Hmm. What's going on there? So either, you know, it's a different pressing, maybe, maybe it was a much more rare pressing. Probably not. Probably just record store number two, probably just overgrades the record. And to them, it's a 19, I think 84 copy. And they're like, Oh, this is vintage. Like it's, it's, it's super rare. You know, anything that's old is valuable. Right? So you've got it. You've got to start to understand and getting out there and dealing with as many records as you can in the flesh and online to get your bearings as far as how to, how to grade and how to price and how to establish what your pricing and grading structure is. Cause again, it's a very subjective across the board. Um, based on um, who the collector is, who the buyer is, who the seller is, right? So, and I will preface lastly in regards to grading and pricing um, before I do that full demonstration on the next video, like I mentioned, but online versus, off, online versus offline is interesting. Um, and what I mean by that is there are um, albums that I see all the time that I will put, I will grade and price and put it in my local store. And in my local store, I know that it's a much more uh, reduced audience because there's only so many people who walk through and shop for records on a, on, a, on a daily, weekly basis in a local shop, right? So you've got to price it accordingly. Like I'm not going to put the top tier price on something if it's a really niche album that a lot of people maybe don't even know. It's different if it's something that's super popular. If you've got a really clean copy of Dark Side of the Moon, it's probably going to move quickly because those are the types of titles that a lot of most collectors are looking for as they're building their collection, you know. But if you've got a really niche title, putting it in for a top tier price in your in your local shop, it may sit around for months. Versus taking it and moving it and selling it online, you can probably put that top tier price or more because your audience is gonna be exponentially bigger. You're talking about the entire country or if you ship internationally, the entire world of people who may be looking for that record. So there's two different prices there. There really are. Not all the times, but there's a lot of scenarios where the local price, man, you need to be smarter about that if you wanna move it. If you don't wanna ship as many records, well, you better have better pricing in your stores then. Because if you price top tier, and especially when you're starting out, you're not gonna have massive foot track it massive foot traffic because your customer base is just beginning. So you need to price stuff probably in the beginning. Uh, you need to kind of underprice. That way you get people to through your store, they find some deals and will hopefully come back. Over time you can inch up your prices and maybe um, you know get them get them more in line with let's say market value across the board. But that I guess the, the moral is the market value locally doesn't always mirror the market value online. So you need to be smart about that. And again, the only way to learn that is to, to get out there to research, to buy, to sell and do these things. And you'll start to understand that for, for particular albums, for particular genres and niches, like sometimes they don't sell well locally, but they can move online really quickly, even at different price points. That's something to keep in mind. So, all right. So that's, that's a little bit about selling. Um, I do, I do sell most of, uh, the vast majority of my pre-owned and vintage records locally in physical shops. And that's because of the grading and the pricing. I'm much more confident selling a record, a pre-owned record locally because that buyer can actually see it themselves. It's a lot harder online, even with pictures to show the condition of something. It's very hard to take a great picture. I don't care how great of a photographer you are of an album to show, you know, does it have surface scratches? Does it, does it have ring wear on the cover? Like those are all the things that you're looking that a buyer is looking at locally and they can make a decision for themselves because they've got it in their hands. So that's really the main reason why I over index on selling most of my pre-owned stuff locally. But again, if it's niche and it's really clean, then uh, I will typically sell it online if it doesn't move pretty quickly in the store. So that's just a decision that I make based on kind of album per album, right? On, on more kind of higher end stuff. If it's lower end, you know, three, five, ten dollar records, like almost all of those go into my local inventory. I don't sell, try not to sell anything pre-owned online unless it's, 
you know, $30, $40 or up. And sometimes even beyond that just depends what it is, right? Um, I mentioned undergrading. I think that's really important in the beginning. I did, I did that. I, did, I didn't knowingly do it, but looking back, it was executed perfectly. When I started out, I looked back, I've looked back actually at the photos from my very first initial pop-up sale. And when I first opened my very first small shop, um, at the prices I was selling stuff at. Now, keep in mind, this is going back a few years. So prices have increased first of all, but even still, I looked at some of them. I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I was selling it for that. But it worked perfectly. I didn't knowingly price stuff cheap and then ramp up the price. The market, fluctuated and prices went up. But at the same time, it really helped because I had a lot of customers who came in uh, from the very beginning and who have stuck with me throughout thick and thin over the course of years because they got some really great deals from me early on and that established a relationship. So I'm, I, I think it's a great strategy to start off a, because you want to acquire customers. That's the most important thing for your business as you're starting off. But secondarily, you're just starting off. You don't know enough yet. You're not knowledgeable enough uh, from a pricing, from a grading perspective to price at the very, very high end. You come in right off the bat and you're pricing all the top tier stuff at the maximum Discogs value or the maximum sold price of everything on eBay. Like your stuff's going to sit around forever. That's not what you need to do. You need to move through inventory. You need to create a customer base. You need to create some loyalty. So give some people some deals right off the bat. Move the inventory as quickly as you can to get people to spend money with you so that they'll come back and spend more. Like I, I can't preface that enough. Um, and then I also think there's a balance to strike in regards to selling and inventory of quantity versus quality. Quantity can be good. People like going into a record store and digging through discount bins and bargain bins. So you want to have some of that. But at the same time, you don't want all of that because you don't want, at least I don't want my record store to feel like it's a garage sale or a glorified thrift store or a, or a uh, um, estate sale, right? Like, so you want to have some quality too. And I think, again, in the beginning, that's kind of hard, a harder balance to strike because you're low on inventory. You're just starting out. You don't have the luxury of only putting the best stuff out. You're putting out whatever, whatever you can get your hands on, honestly, which is totally fine. But just keep it in mind over time, um, you know, what percentage of your pre-owned inventory do you want to be like, you know, more quality, graded, priced, sleeve, I would say $10, $15 and up per albums type of type of stuff versus dollar bin or two or three dollar discount type records more common stuff maybe the conditions not up to par or maybe they're just not most desirable desirable titles but people do like digging through them people do like finding you know picking out a record that's 15 or 20 dollars maybe they buy one or two of those and then they go to the bargain bin and they may, may find two or three records that are a dollar each or something so they you know they got two kind of higher end albums but then they they walked home with five or six albums because they got a couple of discount bin albums as well people love that i love that when i was collecting records and buying records at record stores always hitting the dollar bins to see if there's anything good undiscovered and a lot of times there's nothing wrong with a dollar bin record like there's perfectly good music that is common and costs a dollar or costs two dollars or five dollars it's just not collectible uh, from a value perspective um, or from a demand perspective just because they're very common right I tell people all the time when i'm buying a collection there's nothing wrong with these records there's just no demand for them monetarily so i can't pay you a lot for them and a lot of times people go oh, okay you know it's not that i'm calling your collection garbage just because i'm only offer you a dollar a piece or a quarter a piece doesn't mean that it's no good. It just means that there's not a lot of people out there who are willing to pay more for that. It doesn't mean the music is bad, right? So that's a little bit about selling. So, all right. So we talked about sourcing, buying, grading, pricing, and selling. There you go. That's a that's a pretty good starter uh, conversation on pre-owned inventory. Um, like I mentioned, I'm going to do another episode specifically on a grading and pricing demonstration. I'm excited to do that. Hopefully you'll tune in next. That'll be the next episode. And then we'll also talk about new inventory, which is a whole other can of worms. So as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. Um, I've learned a lot over the years and I'm happy to pass it along. Hopefully it's helpful. This is just my perspective. There's guys who've been running record stores for 50 years who could school me left and right. I'm well aware of that. 
all I can do is teach you what I've learned over the last, uh, you know, four to five years that I've got into this business. So hopefully this was helpful and we will see you again next time on episode, uh, what is this going to be episode four, which will be the grading and pricing demonstration. So, uh, keep an eye out, eye out for that one. It'll be within the, uh, the how to open a record store playlist and we'll see you again, uh, next time and we'll dive in even deeper. This has been another episode of Talking About Records. My name is G.I. Sanders, and we'll see you again next time.